Meanwhile, the White House planning for next week's State of the Union address. And we're learning President Trump is preparing two versions of his speech, one that can be delivered on Capitol Hill, despite no commitment from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi at this time. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says the president accepted Pelosi's earlier invitation to deliver his address before the House chamber. Nancy Pelosi invited the president. He accepted. She cited security concerns as a potential reason to delay that. Uh, the United States Secret Service and DHS have addressed those concerns, and we're moving forward until uh, something changes on that front. Kevin Cork is live from the White House. Kevin, how many plans does the White House have for the president to deliver this State of the Union address next week? Well, you hit the nail on the head. They've got a couple, at least publicly, although I think, to be fair, uh, there are probably many more when you think about all the variables at play here. To be sure, we do know there are at least two speeches that are being prepared for the president to give his remarks to congressional lawmakers. Now, clearly, the preferred option, Sandra, is to see the president deliver the State of the Union in the House chamber per tradition. That, of course, depends on whether or not the speaker extends the invitation to do so. Now, failing that, perhaps he could do so in the Senate chamber or, sources tell Fox News, it's possible he could hold a rally-style event outside of Washington to deliver his message to the American people and send remarks to congressional lawmakers in writing. Now, by any measure, there is a real defiance here at the White House. Uh, the president will speak to Congress and the American people one way or another. The only thing we don't know yet is where. Sandra? <laughs> We'll see. We're days away now, Kevin. Meanwhile, yeah. day 33 of the partial government shutdown. What is the White House strategy to get Democrats to the bargaining table here? Yeah, I think there's sort of a two-tiered approach to this problem. There's a public approach, and then there's also a private approach. Publicly, you're going to see the White House coordinate with GOP lawmakers. Again, this idea of, let's see if we can hold a vote on the president's proposals in the hopes of getting some Democrats to for lack of a better description, break with their leadership. And then there's a more private outreach, people like Jared Kushner making his way to Capitol Hill, looking for common ground with Democrats. But to be sure, there is frustration here because White House officials say Democrats are just playing politics. The fact that Democrats went out before the president even put his uh, proposal forward on Saturday and rejected it shows us exactly where they are. But they're simply looking to kick the can down the road. We've seen no indication that Democrats want to work with the, with the president to actually fix the problems facing this country. And the president on Twitter today said this, build a wall and crime will fall. I imagine we will hear that uh, a lot, a lot over the next several days and perhaps even weeks. Now, Speaker Pelosi has been clear. She said the president's effectively holding government employees hostage and you can't deal with a person if every time they don't like what you're doing, they threaten to shut down or in this case, shut down the government. That's what Democrats say. So now 33 days in, still no closer to a solution, Sandra, than we were more than a month ago. The president calling that a new theme in a tweet this morning, build a wall yeah. and crime will fall. Kevin Cork, thank you. More on both these Good stories now. Guy Benson, politics editor, townhall.com and co-host of Benson and Harf. Guy, how you doing? Good morning to you. Hey, I Bill. want to go back to the morning. Covington story. I've got a number of things I want you to reflect on. Wall Street Journal headline from late last night, the high school deplorables, it writes, MAGA hats, the March for Life, Covington Catholic and the mob. How has this story developed by the day, do you believe? Well, it began with a snippet that looked bad. A lot of people went out and condemned it, including myself on Twitter. And then additional evidence trickled in. And that evidence over time has, I think, very clearly showed that these kids were wronged here. They were not this pack of aggressive, race-baiting teenagers that they were portrayed as. They were just standing around waiting for a bus, being berated by this bizarre fringe group of homophobic racists for a long time and then mr and phillips guide, came in with the drum and that's the part of the story that i think has been lost in all this yes and that, that's the black hebrew israelites that happened long before this you go online yes. and, and you can see this runs for an hour and 15 minutes guy so these are the black hebrew israelites they're grown adults they have extreme views they're clearly racist they're clearly anti-gay they're anti-white they're agitators of the highest form. Right. And they were the initial ones who provoked this long before the Native American came on. Absolutely. Uh, on with his drum. Now, with, with that, I want to go back to the Wall Street Journal editorial from earlier today. The boys have been taunted 
by a group of black Hebrew Israelites who shouted racist and homophobic slurs. Far from the boys confronting Mr. Phillips, he confronts them as they were right. waiting near the Lincoln Memorial for their bus. It continues. On the whole, these teenagers were calm amid the provocations and far less incendiary than the adults who taunted them and the progressive high priest who denounced them. Uh, they're, they're talking about the school and the leaders of the archdiocese back in Northern Kentucky. Grant Hillman is a student. He was on earlier today in Fox and Friends and described the reaction many of them are getting and their families back home. The threats, they've been horrible. I've never heard such cruel things wished upon another human being. It ranges from getting locked inside a building and burned alive to sexually assaulted by the clergy members. It's, it's just awful. Now we have this wicked stew guy of initial reaction that goes viral and a story that waits to be unfolded and it takes days for it to be told. And yet all this evidence has come out, Bill, that I think is very exculpatory for the kids in this case and the wall street journal editorial is exactly right in terms of the details and really who's at fault here and despite all of that evidence yesterday that school had to be shut down because of the threats that we just heard about which is absolutely disgusting even if you believe if you want to believe against all odds and against the evidence that we've seen that the kids are the bad guys here which they're not a response of death threats is bizarre and and horrible and completely uh, unforgivable so this is an example of people seeing what they wanted to believe about a bunch of white male young trump supporters jumping to their foregone conclusion that confirmed all of their priors about who these kids are and what they would do and people too many of them are clinging to that narrative even though it has been thoroughly debunked by video Guy, thank you. I wanted to ask you about the shutdown, but we'll. Uh, I said the state of our union it's is not stalled. going away. I don't the think. state of our <laughs> union is stalled for today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Guy, very much for your analysis sure thing. today. We'll talk very soon. Sandra, what's well, going? we'll have a lot more on that coming up uh, on today's big headlines when we are joined by former White House Press Secretary Sean Sp Spicer later this hour. We'll get to all the latest on Covington, yes. but also the latest on the press briefings at the mm -hmm. White House. That became a big story yesterday as well. We'll ask him about that. Looking forward to having Sean back today. Uh, another alert now from overseas. An update to this situation with the actor Alec Baldwin uh, entering into a plea deal. He was in court a short time ago. Uh, he has been found guilty to second degree violation of harassment. So this is not a crime. This is a violation. Um, he's also been told that he has to take part in the short anger uh, he, he did plead guilty to second degree violation of harassment. The point here is it's not criminal, it's a violation, but he has been told he has to take uh, part in a short anger management program and pay a $120 surcharge. Uh, no comment from Baldwin or his attorney after they left the courtroom. They have already departed, uh, but that is the outcome of that. I think uh, physical barriers are a part of the solution. Depends upon what a wall is used for, whether it's moral or immoral. Uh, if, if it's protecting people, it's moral. If it's uh, imprisoning people, it may well be immoral. But that's not the issue. The issue is we want border security. We want to make sure that people who come in the United States of America are authorized to do so. There's Democrat Cindy Hoyer apparently breaking with the speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Carl Rove's with me now to talk about the Trump v. Pelosi battle here. Carl, how you doing? Good morning to you. Good morning. Saw where some moderate Dems wrote a letter to Nancy Pelosi yesterday saying, give them something. Let's get this thing going. Okay, where are we now on day 33? Well, we're about ready to have some action in the Senate with these two votes, which I think will show that there's not 60 votes in the Senate for either the Democrat approach or the president's approach, but hopefully the result of that will be to lead to some negotiations to arrive at something that can get 60 votes in the Senate, pass the House, and most important of all, get the president's signature on it. But uh, at least we got a little bit of movement, and, and you can't solve the problem unless you've got some movement. And we're, we're not only seeing movement in the Senate, but you touched on too. Steny Hoyer, a number two Democrat in the House, or number three Democrat in the House, says uh, we need to uh, uh, have barriers. And then we have the 30-some-odd uh, uh, centrist Democrats who say to Pelosi, uh, we've got to have uh, give the president something that he wants in the way of a, a barrier along the southern border. So starting to see a little movement, but we have, we have to have movement in order Here's to get Here's what I'm hearing result. from Republicans. Where are your Democratic ideas? Well, where is your list of things that you would consider immigration enforcement? Have we seen it? 
Well, we've, we've, seen some, we've seen a little bit of conversation recently, but let's step back. I, I must admit, over the years, I've become a cynic about the cynicism of the Democrats. They had the Congress with huge majorities in 2009 and 10 didn't resolve the problem. President Obama said in 2009, 10, and 11, he didn't have the authority to unilaterally decide the issue of the Dreamers. And then when he got into electoral trouble in 2012, literally concerned about the level of enthusiasm in the Latino community, he issued his DACA order. So when they had a chance to do something about it, they didn't do anything. And, and back in 2006 and 7, in 2007, when Bush, Kennedy, and McCain had a comprehensive immigration reform, it was Democrats like Obama and others who, Byron Dorgan of North Dakota, who, who basically Basically gutted an important element of it and made it, a, it made it blew, blew it all up. So, I, you know, Nancy Pelosi, it's, it's interesting to me. She says President Trump's call for a wall is immoral. Well, where was she when President Obama built 130 some odd miles of wall along the border? This is all tied up in politics. This has more to do with 2020 than it has to do with the resolution of two real problems we have. What do we do about the dreamers? And we, what do we do about these people who came here under temporary protected status from countries that are either ravaged by I'm warfare not, yeah. or ravaged by natural uh, disaster. I'm 30 seconds left and I gotta run here. Um, I, I don't hear from you a way out of this yet. Do you see one? Well, I, the way out of it is to have the Senate votes and hope that people start to see that there is a way to get this done if everybody gives something and get people around the table. And so the, so the Republicans say, we want 5.7, but we'll, uh, the Democrats say, we'll give you four, but we want this on the docket. You've got to have people sitting around the table trying to arrive at an agreement. That's why Hoyer's comment is important. That's why the centrist Democrats are important. But really, we've got to have a lot more after these votes tomorrow okay, very, uh, in the Senate. Well, so we'll watch both of that then. We'll, all three of those things. I should say. Thank you, sir. Nice to see you in Austin. You bet. Over there you bet. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. I think the press jumps the gun a lot because we just, we have so much circumstantial evidence against this guy that we basically are hoping that, you know, Cohen's got the goods and what have you. But and so it's wishful thinking. Evidence. As far as I'm concerned, we still have no Robert Mueller report. We have no report as a result of that investigation. But that was Joy Behar. And it was an admission um, because we're so desperate to get this president, she said. Do you think there's going to be lessons learned from all this, Sean? Not really. I mean, we saw it just a few days ago with the BuzzFeed story. I would have thought that, that a lot of folks in the media would have learned their lesson from jumping on that false bandwagon, but they didn't. And again, remember, it's not Joy Behar going against the president. He's a tough guy. He can handle the hits and the insults. But why are we invoking a bunch of young kids in this debate to make them suffer because of Joy Behar and other members of the media's distrust and hatred of this president? I think that is absolutely wrong. And the idea that one CNN contributor said these kids should be punched in the face. Others talked about other things that should happen to them. Kathy Griffin, a despicable individual who's done tons of reprehensible stuff in the past, talked about how their names should be named. These are children. They are sons and daughters. They went out there to, to march for life, to do something that they believed in, and they did nothing but stand their ground and just wait for their bus to come. And why are we, by the way, the one thing that's interesting to me, Sandra, in this whole story is that this all was precipitated by an anti-Semitic anti uh, a, a, a anti-semitic uh, group that started chanting at these individuals um, and all of the folks in the media have left those folks off one thing's They've, for sure no, when you no watch condemnation those, from NBC News this morning of them when you watch uh, the interviews that these kids gave you just they're, they're kids um, they we'll, are we'll leave that there for now I got to ask you about these White House press briefings we asked Hogan Gid Gidley the standing deputy press secretary yesterday on this program about those press briefings and the fact that we haven't seen Sarah Sanders deliver one so far this year the president uh, weighed in shortly after that interview uh, said he, he basically told her not to bother uh, the reporters are rude to her in that room. She gave an interview on Fox and Friends this morning, basically saying, I talk to the press every single day. I just wonder from someone who used to stand on that podium and knows the importance of delivering that press briefing, did the White House make the right move here? Look, I, I think we all have to remember what the, what the goal of the briefing is. It's to speak on behalf of the president of the United States when he is unable to do so for himself. This president, frankly, engages with the president probably more with the media on a regular basis than any president in the past, through pool sprays, through one-on-one -on -one meetings, through interviews, et cetera, et cetera. There is no way that you can say that this president 
uh, is leaving the press wondering what he thinks on any given issue, whether it's directly through interviews and opportunities through his Twitter feed. He is communicating directly with the American people and with members of the press. Sarah doesn't have to go out there and do a briefing if the president's engaging with the press on an almost daily basis. Uh, I think the press briefing is to do so in lieu of that. So they're making the right call on this. And the second part that the president brought up is that I think that the briefing turned into a circus where you've created a bunch of YouTube stars that were B-rate reporters to begin with that had gotten no recognition in the past and they felt if they acted out. And this has never been about the content of the question. I don't really care about that. They are supposed to ask tough, hard questions. It's about the conduct. They want to make it into a circus. They want to make themselves stars. They want to get viral videos. I get that. But the White House's job is to provide information to the public and the media, and they can do so in much more efficient ways. All right. Sean Spicer, great to get your take on all those things this morning. Thank you. Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman, good morning and welcome back yeah, here. Good morning. I'm going to go you. through a couple of topics on Afghanistan. What is your sense about the level of violence there and how that may or may not influence the president's decision? Well, I think it should influence him to stay, to double down, to say that, you know, obviously terrorism is not eradicated. They're still coming after Americans. They have a saying, America has the watches, we have the time. The only way they'll ever beat us is to beat us at our will. Uh, so my hope is he doubles down and in that process says, look, we're happy to negotiate with the Taliban to find a way out, but they're not going to beat us on the battlefield. And I think we can get a negotiated solution that's favorable well, in that context. Does it appear that he's leaning in that direction? Would you suggest the same in terms of doubling down on Syria? Yeah, I think when I say double down, it doesn't mean double the number of troops. It means double commitment. Just say, look, if you look at Iraq, for instance, when President Bush did the surge, it wasn't the addition of 20,000 troops that really made the difference. It was the fact that when everybody told him to leave, he said, I'm staying. And we saw our enemies turn on a dime and actually become our allies. So I think it's important to put that message out that we won't be defeated by our will, but we want to negotiate a way out of this. Do you think someone at the White House has his ear on that? I oh, I do. I mean, I, I've met with the president a couple times on this, and he's very introspective. He listens. I think Rand Paul has outsized uh, influence on the president on this. He uses very kind of seductive language like bring everybody home, you know, no more. We can't have any more people get injured. And that as a commander in chief, that's tempting because you never want to see people get injured or hurt. But being commander in chief means you have to make tough decisions sometimes. Uh, wow, that's in interesting. Let's, let's see where that goes. Well, you have a prediction on the shutdown? Where, where, do you think, where do you think that goes? You know, look, the president made a great offer, I think. It's fine if the Democrats don't like it. They need to counter offer with something serious, and they're not doing that. But in terms of what actually happens, I've been out here. I'm starting my ninth year. Um, usually some solution will come out of the Senate. That's what I've seen in the past. I hope the Senate can come up with some kind of a negotiated solution that we can get out of this, because there's so much damage being done. And ultimately, even if one side wins, do you really win after all this? I don't think so. I think we're all kind of losing Do you out think here Democrats right have ideas in immigration? If so, where are they? Where, where's the list? I think they have an idea, but it's no border security. I mean, it's just basically straight amnesty. It's, it's liberalize the immigration system. I want an immigration system that's very generous, but we have to have border security in the process to make it actually work. So again, if you don't like it, Nancy Pelosi, counter with something that's realistic. But be, let's be honest, that counter can't be no wall. Give me some money for the wall, call it a barrier, call it unicorns and puppies. I don't care what it's named, but ultimately it's a part of border security that's essential. And then we can fix a lot of this other stuff, and Americans will be happy well, if we as do. As a member of the U.S. military, I just want to ask you about the Supreme Court ruling yesterday on transgenders. Apparently it will revert back to the prior rule uh, prior to President Obama's declaration. Department of Justice said this, Department of Defense is the authority to create and implement personnel policies. It has determined are necessary to best defend our nation. Due to lower courts issuing nationwide injunctions, our military has been forced to maintain a prior policy that poses a risk to military effectiveness and lethality for over a year. Do you agree with that statement, sir? Yeah, I think it's important that the military does have the ability to make that decision, and the commander-in-chief does, too. I, I know this is a social issue of, you know, the utmost of debating right now, but there's two points. If somebody is currently transgender and has been through all that process, that's one separate issue. But if somebody joins the military and then decides they want to go through that, there's about a year or two where they are actually non-deployable because of the different therapies and things that they're going through, and that is a readiness concern. If you have somebody with a four-year enlistment, if 50% 
percent of that time they're not deployable, that's an issue. And we ultimately, you know, serving in the military is a privilege, and we need people that are going to go out there and do everything they can to let's kill see, our enemies. Let's see where this goes. Sir, thank you for your time. Adam Kinsey. You Unicorns and puppies are that's on it. order. Thank you for your time. <laughs> You're saying. See ya. Chaos at a major U.S. airport after reports of drone sightings thousands of feet in the air. We're live on the ground with the very latest on what we're learning there. Also, President Trump looking to capitalize on judicial success, renominating 50 judges to U.S. federal courts. Uh, what this will mean for the Republican Party and beyond coming up here. Sandra. Plus another battle brewing in the Senate as lawmakers prepare to vote on two proposals to end the shutdown. The only proposal, the only one currently before us that can be signed by the president and immediately reopen the government. It's the only proposal that would reopen the government fully and immediately. But it's not merely a continuing resolution. Think of this idea. They've got competing ideas now to end the shutdown tomorrow, but neither one looks like it has the votes to pass. Ellison Barber is herding cats up on Capitol Hill. Hey, morning, Ellison. Hey, Bill. Yeah, that's right. So neither proposal is expected to get the 60 votes necessary to pass, but it is still significant because this is really the first time we've seen the Senate make a major legislative move since the shutdown began. One proposal the Senate is expected to vote on is the offer from President Trump, the one that trades $5.7 billion for temporary extensions to programs like deferred action for childhood arrivals and temporary protected status. What you hear so many people talk about as TPS, Democrats are not on board with it. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer says it is a one-sided, harshly partisan, and a proposal made in bad faith. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says it is the only bill before the Senate that can get President Trump's signature and reopen the government. To reject this proposal, Democrats would have to prioritize political combat with the president ahead of federal workers, ahead of DACA recipients, ahead of border security and ahead of stable and predictable government funding. Is that really a price that Democrats want to pay to prolong this episode, which they say they want to be over and done with? The other proposal set for a Thursday vote is one approved by the Democratic-controlled House. It would reopen the government through February 8th. It does not include funding for a border wall. People are saying, isn't there a way out of this mess? Isn't there a way to relieve the burden on the 800,000 federal workers not getting paid? Isn't there a way to get government services open first and then debate what we should do for border security? Well, now there's a way. So again, if these are going to pass, that would mean that 60 senators need to vote in favor of either bill. That means that some Democrats and some Republicans would need to deflect from their party line if we're going to see either of these move forward. And so far, Bill, we're not expecting to see that happen. Thank bill. you, Ellison. We're watching it with you. Thanks. The headlines there from the Hill. Hey, thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. The student is at the center of that controversy that swept the nation is now speaking out. Brand new interview today as the Kentucky high school students go back to school for the first time. A lot of security in place as we say good morning from New York. I'm Bill Hemmer. Welcome to Wednesday. How you doing? And we welcome you back, Thank Bill. You nice to have you here this you. morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith, lawmakers, students, the White House, all weighing in on that viral confrontation this morning. Nick Sandman now telling the Today Show he wishes he could have avoided the entire situation. The White House showing its support to the students with lawmakers, chaperones, and others joining in. Do you feel from this experience that you owe anybody an apology? Do you see your own fault in any way? As far as standing there, I had every right to do so. I don't, I, my position is that I was not disrespectful to Mr. Phillips. I respect him. I'd like to talk to him. I mean, I, in hindsight, I wish we could have walked away and avoided the whole thing. But I can't say that I'm sorry. When the out of context video was circulating around and everyone was making their opinions just based off that, I can say I definitely was. I was not looking in a good light and my reputation probably wasn't the best at the time. I think they're gonna grow from this. I mean, right now we're all hurting. Um, we don't like 
what has happened to our sons, to the boys that we've watched grow up, be attacked like this. People were yelling some incredibly vile and racist things at these teenage students. None of that was covered. That was the only true racism and bigotry that was evident on that day. Since that time, there's been an incredible amount of bigotry shown by the media. There is a lot of reaction on this one to start outside the school today. That's where Doug McElwee is, Park Hills, Kentucky. Doug, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Rainy day out here, which has kept the crowds down very low, and the school is, is roped off and blocked off by a lot of police officers. I've been talking a lot about uh, Robert Barnes, a uh, Los Angeles-based attorney who has been threatening uh, in very non-specific ways in recent days about suing uh, many people, whether it be large media companies or celebrities or Twitter users who have defamed, in his words, uh, the students here at uh, Covington Catholic School. Today, he was on Fox and Friends and offered a great deal more specificity. Here he is. Shouting a bunch of, you know, homophobic, racist, uh, derogatory comments at us. What kinds of things did you hear them say? I heard them call us incest kids, bigots, racists. Did you feel like he was trying to get somewhere else to go toward the Lincoln Memorial? I'm not sure where he wanted to go. And if he wanted to walk past me, I would have let him. I wanted the situation to die down, and uh, I just wish he would have walked away. But I knew as long as I kept my composure and didn't do anything that he might perceive as aggressive. That was uh, obviously not the lawyer in question. That was uh, Nick Sandman, who spoke on the Today Show this morning. Couldn't quite make out what he was saying there. Uh, but the other person, the other key player in this drama, the Native American elder, who uh, is uh, uh, the other figure here, has also been continuing a, a publicity spree of sorts. He uh, rejected an offer by a Cincinnati restaurateur recently to be flown first class to Covington, Kentucky, to one of his four-star restaurants here, and to, quote-unquote, break bread with the students from Covington, Kentucky. He rejected that. But yesterday, he apparently changed his mind, agreed to come to Covington and to the school to meet with the students. That, after it came to light, that on Saturday, January 19th, he came with a group of 20 or so Native Americans, this is the day after the March for Life, to the Washington, D.C. Basilica, the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, and tried to inter interrupt a mass there with chants and drum beating. A guard who kept him from entering the solemn mass called it deeply upsetting. Nathan Phillips has also uh, appeared uh, to have been very, very vague about his military record. He has called himself a Vietnam Times veteran, a Vietnam Times uh, veteran, uh, also referring to himself as a recon ranger. There is no such category within the United States Marine Corps. Both the New York Times and the Washington Post have issued corrections regarding uh, their calling him a Vietnam veteran. So more to come on that. Uh, very quiet day, as I said. Things are basically closed off here at the Covington Catholic High School right now. Reporters are gathering in front yards of people here because any available parking lot to set up your equipment is unavailable, blocked off by police. Very very secure here, and I think the students appreciate that. Back to you, Bill. A lot of layers on the story. Thank you, Doug. Doug McKelvey, good to have you there. Thank you. Sam. Real movie Frozen, Smitty. That's See you beautiful. There. Stunning pictures, Niagara Falls, the Arctic blast that buried the Midwest under a frosty snow blanket, put the Northeast into a deep freeze, bringing the rushing waters to an icy standstill, making for one breathtaking spectacle. Good stuff there, Niagara Falls. Yeah, it depends. It looks like the stunning. American side there. I mean, Niagara Falls is stunning yes. anytime, mm -hmm. but like that, I've never seen it. Have you? Not a, Unbelievable I'm shots there. It's like the real movie, Frozen. I mean, <laughs> you check it out yourself, right? All right. Meanwhile, air traffic back to normal today after a chaotic evening at Newark Airport, where incoming flights were halted after reports of drone activity above a private airport nearby. David Lee Miller is live in Newark, New Jersey with all the details here. Hey, David Lee. Sandra, it bears repeating at this hour, it is business as usual here at Newark Airport, but at about five o'clock last night, a very different situation. All arriving flights were temporarily halted after pilots spotted a nearby drone. Now, according to an FAA spokesman, they are investigating a report the drone came within about 30 feet of an aircraft. It was actually spotted near a smaller airport uh, nearby that is used mainly by private planes. As a precaution, all in 
incoming flights at Newark put on hold and had the, they had a circle for about 30 minutes. But other flights still on the ground at other airports that were heading to Newark had their takeoffs delayed. Departing flights at Newark, though, were not affected. That's because they used a different flight path. The FAA says the disruption was, quoting now, minimal in the broader context, but drone sightings at airports are a growing problem. Last year, there were 2,185 such incidents in the U.S. That's up 835 percent from 2014. And on the minds of many, the drone sightings near Gatwick Airport outside of London just before Christmas, that disruption lasted several days. More than a thousand flights canceled. The total cost, $64.5 million. The FAA says that measures are now in place to prevent a reoccurrence here at Newark. They have ways to, they say, bring a drone down both safely and quickly. And following 9-11, Sandra, you might recall that a network was established to uh, respond to this type of event. Various uh, agencies and law enforcement are contacted immediately. Wow. And for the record, it is illegal to fly a drone more than 400 feet in the air and within five miles of an airport. This drone, Sandra, was spotted at 3,500 feet. That's more than half a mile. Back to you. Illegal, unsafe, costly, as you've laid out for us. David Lee Miller, what a story. Thank more you. More to come on this, too. I mean, drones only become more and more popular. And what he talked about at Gatwick last week, that was a big issue. They shut it down twice, I do believe. It'd be a real problem. A period of time. So keep an eye on this story. Okay, Joy Behar says she can explain the national right to judgment on the Covington High School incident. I know how our school raises these kids. I know that no one from our school would be disrespectful. And everybody else who was in, in the video that was surrounding the area, they told me that he, had, he was not trying to do that at all. Like, I know what kind of kids Cubcath raises, and it's not disrespect. A Covington student on Fox and Friends earlier, as new light is shed on a viral video that appeared to show students with a Native American protesters. A protester, students are returning to class this morning for the first time since that confrontation. Sean Spicer is senior advisor and spokesperson for America First PAC and former White House press secretary. Sean, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Sandra. I know you're a dad, and you look on at that, and you look at these, you look at these boys several days later after the country really has had a chance to digest and learn more about this story, and you feel for them. Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I think now that everything has come to light and we've seen the entirety, uh, or at least much more of this video, here's what we do know. These kids were marching for life. They waited for, they were waiting for their bus to pick them up. They were approached by a group of racist, anti-Semitic individuals who were yelling epithets at them. That's not in question. This Native American gentleman apparently tried to defuse the situation, but again, he approached them, not the other way around. They just stood there quietly, peacefully, kind of, you know, jumping in. But let's keep in context the entire thing. These are kids. The other two groups of individuals are adults. And yet the rush to judgment by the mainstream media and the folks to the left against these kids and their kids was because, number one, they were marching for life. And that's not cool in the eyes of the mainstream media. And number two is because they were Trump supporters wearing Make America Great hats. If the shoe had been on the other foot, if this had been a group of, of young students on the left that were protesting some progressive cause and it was a right-leaning group that had come in, the narrative would be about how these adults were harassing these kids. But somehow the mainstream media has turned it into these kids are bad. And the only reason that I can honestly think of is one, because they stood up for life, which is not cool in the eyes of the media, and two, because they apparently are Trump supporters. It's interesting because we just had heard a taste of, of Joy Behar and in this sort of admission that she made as to why she thinks this snap judgment occurred. Here she is. 